10, 12 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> people are I, making fun I can see myself doing that easily. <laughs> So yeah, no, we're we're live. Um, so the, Ben Powell, you're the author of Out of Poverty, and it's and the subtitle is something like yeah, make it easy for you. you can read right off there, Jeff. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Out of poverty, sweatshops in the global economy. Cool. Now this, is, as far as you know, is the first kind of systematic examination and more or less defense of sweatshops as an economic institution, right? Yeah. So it's a defense of sweatshops, but of a particular variety. So this isn't a defense of sweatshops that says, you know, economic efficiency is important, so we need to sacrifice workers for that or put profits over people or any of that type of stuff. What it is, it's a means-ends analysis, a very Austrian means-ends analysis, where the ends are the welfare of third world workers or potential workers. And uh, the question is, what means are going to help make their lives better? Yeah, and, and you do a lot of case studies um, in various places. Are there, are there cases of sweatshops that you find okay, are inconsistent with economic growth that are violating human rights, so that sort of thing, uh, and, and some that are, or do distinguish? Yeah, so I think it's, it's important that what I'm talking about in this book is sweatshops where workers choose to work, admittedly from a bad set of other alternatives, but that choice demonstrates that they believe it's their least bad option. Um, there are, and I've scanned, so what we did on this, how we define a sweatshop or how I define one is, Whatever critics say, that's a sweatshop in a pejorative sense. Okay, that's a sweatshop that I'm going to study. So basically from 1995 through 2010, scan all the instances of popular news sources reporting sweatshops uh, in this negative light. And that's what I include in here. There were a few, Jeff, rare instances where there was a case where it could be coercion that's making, and I don't mean the coercion of economic necessity or some garbage like that. I mean where there was a threat of violence of making the workers come to work there. Those aren't part of what my study is. Those are slave labor. I think whether you're a libertarian or any other feasible moral view, you should be opposed to slave labor and want to dry up the demand for its product. But I tell you, I could count on, on one hand the number of instances of those I found in the press compared to tons of the other sort. And even those that one hand is kind of ambiguous where it's not clear what it's often cases of workers moving from one country to another where their passports are being held against their will possibly afterwards and it's not clear what the explicit contract was going into that if, if it was an indentured servitude or what have you. But, 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 but most, mostly you find uh, people you know, heaping uh, tons of condemnation on these institutions. You look at them and you find out that people are being made better off and being given better options and that we're at a certain stage of economic growth uh, yeah. where this that's really needed, right? Yeah, I mean, so this is the, the main thing that we that I did in this book is it's the first systematic evidence of how sweatshops compare to the alternative employment in, in these other countries. And what we find is that there's just widespread massive poverty in these countries, people living under $2, a dollar twenty-five a day. In these sweatshop cases, every country that we found the sweatshops in, the average protested sweatshop got their workers above that $2 a day threshold. And I think, in fact, out of the entire... 15-year time period, there were maybe four or five individual episodes where the factory didn't get them above, above that standard. And almost all of those were in Bangladesh, where roughly 80% of the population in this time period didn't make it over the, the $2 a day standard. So the sweatshops are much better than the abject poverty that's in these countries. And in fact, actually, when you compare it to average living standards, a lot of them are far above the average living standard. And most of these very things that we're protesting are somewhere around average income in the countries. Uh, I'll just tell you why I thought about you and this topic. Uh, there was an article in Salon, I guess, yesterday, the day before, by a guy who said, look, I mean, he's just giving up on, on sort of a capitalist theory because uh, he's, among other reasons, he's disgusted by the existence of, of sweatshops. And th so this, this is just rooted in a, in a confusion. Yeah, I mean, is he disgusted by the, the abject poverty that's existed through most of, of human history? Uh, sweatshops are one stage of economic development and it's a you know first rung on the ladder above subsistence agriculture type living. I know of no rich country today, at least that's not rich off of oil, that didn't go through a kind of stage of sweatshop development where you had lousy working conditions and low wages compared to what we have today, but it was a step up from the farms. I mean this is why uh, the women in New England where I'm standing right now actually during the Industrial Revolution in the United States were leaving the farms and going to the factories. They could get paid more there and for that matter had more freedom than living with their, their parents at home. Yeah, right. Exactly. These are these are a result of, of choice. And this and what what happens? By the way, can you give me some quick background? What is the origin of the term sweatshops? Where does it come from? And why do we why do we use that phrase at all? Well, it was 
the original origin, I guess, would be from the sweating system that you had back in the late 19th, early 20th century is, is what they refer to that mode of production as. Um, its modern usage really is from the, it's really the early 1990s that things start to get heated up when the sweatshops come into the, the popular forum. I mean, it was in there in the 80s a little bit, but it's the campaign against Nike by Jeff Belanger in Indonesia that starts getting it notoriety. And then really the last half of the 1990s, it's student groups originally funded by AFL-CIO who go and start creating these students against sweatshop labor chapters on college campuses that gets it a lot of attention. Um, and then various other NGOs kind of running with it there. So I'm just trying to understand now. So the labor unions fund student groups, uh, tap into their sentiment and to their, their sort of do-good uh, sort of mentality. But, but what are the labor unions really after? They, they want to shut down uh, uh, trade. I mean, they're against competition. They want to cartelize the, uh, the market, right? This is a classic case of, you know, Bruce uh, Yandel's uh, bootleggers and Baptist story, where you have the vested interest group who benefits economically from something, and then you kind of have the religious zealot going after it for you. Uh, the labor unions, of course, uh, you know, they'll have you believe that uh, we do this in the name of worker solidarity, workers of the world unite, we want to help these poor workers. Of course not, that's bogus. They're doing their job. A, a union's job is to raise the wages of its members. And these third world workers aren't their members. What they want to do is price their competition out of the market. The only way these workers in the third world compete with workers who are in, say, Unite, the Garment Workers Union in the United States, is by offering their labor more cheaply. So what Unite says is, hey, no, it would be unfair to exploit these workers. You'd have to pay them more and give them better conditions. And of course, what that does is dry up the demand for these workers and get more contracts in the United States for Unite or AFL-CIO workers. So meanwhile, what they did in the 90s is they took these college students in as interns had them investigate sweatshops over the summer while they were intern, and then let them go back to their college campuses and start these activist groups. So that you get kind of naive activists who are being played by evil unions. It's an amazing story. Uh, can you map out for me what would be a typical uh, case of a, of, a, of a poor country with a lack of economic opportunity and an American you know, sort of corporation or some other some other international uh, multinational moves in and starts offering jobs uh, to people. What happens under those conditions? Well, it's usually actually not a U.S. company or multinational that moves in. Most of the things that are made in so-called sweatshops are made by domestic subcontractors that get contract work for the big multinational nationals and chains. So often they already exist there, and it's a question of who's getting which orders. Uh, but, of course, some subcontractors create themselves there specifically to serve this, this niche. And what you find is, you know, it's most of the workers in firms that I've investigated prior to working there worked at some other sweatshop. So they move between the industry. There's this, you know, some people worry about, you know, uh, bargaining power or whatever. It's a pretty competitive industry. Most of the places where there's sweatshops are in some sort of export processing zone where there's lots of other factories and workers uh, tend to move between them or, or are competed for. But ultimately, before there's sweatshops there, it's rural poverty and people leaving the fields coming to these cities to work in the sweatshops. I mean, this is what is happening in China by the millions now, is people leaving the rural interior provinces that are poor, coming to the cities to work in so-called sweatshops and raising their standard of living. So it's a mass migration going on in China to fuel this, uh, much like it was during the Industrial Revolution. I was just thinking that. This sounds like this has been going on for about 300 years. Yeah, so and the, the beauty of it, right, is now it happens so much quicker, Jeff. So if we think about Britain, they had, you know, from the beginning of Industrial Revolution to something that looks like post-sweatshop stages, that's about a 130, 150-year process maybe. The United States, we're looking maybe about 100 years, right, started in the 1820s, we're done by 1930s, so. But sweatshop countries in 1960, it would have been Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea. There was a generation that they went from pre-industrial to post-sweatshop, and for that matter, richer than us in some cases now. Um, and what it is is there's so much more capital and technology in the world today. When Britain was doing it, all of the technology had to be created anew. They had to form the capital. The United States benefited from Britain's advances. In fact, first we, uh, well, depending on what your view on intellectual property is, either stole or borrowed their, their technology, started in our <laughs> here. And then uh, it was British capital that helped finance some of it. So we got, went and now when we see these countries say, and it, now here's the catch, if they get their institutions right, the capital technology flows in, sweatshops are a stage of development that goes by much quicker than in the past. But that's conditional on having good institutions of private property rights, rule of law, economic freedom. 
Um, when the countries don't have that, sweatshops are like a crutch that's the least bad option. When they do get a better environment or even just improve on their environment, they're part of this process that ends sweatshops ultimately as well. I've, I have a strong impression that there's a big move on to kind of uh, re regulate uh, uh, the sweatshops in these countries to force them to raise the living standards, provide health benefits, you know, have the kind of safety regulations. I mean, I, I mean, in the first place, are these kind of campaigns actually effective? Or, or, or is there any multinational institution that's actually imposing this kind of regulatory constraints? Are governments intimidated by these activists? And, and what are the costs of that? Yeah. So I'd say for the most part, no, and that's a good thing. So if we're evaluating the anti-sweatshop movement over the past 15 years, they've been very good at getting this in the public's eye and making it an issue where everybody has a visceral reaction to it. They've been somewhat successful at getting it on companies' agendas so that companies at least pay lip service to it in its marketing and create uh, company codes and such. Where they've been an abject failure is actually getting it in the international trade policy arena. Uh, and it's mostly because poor countries resist this every time that the rich countries start to stick it in a WTO agreement it gets shot down. That's right. Yeah, I think uh, I watched some debate. It was a few years ago. I remember uh, seeing this, that there was some big WT, WTO or maybe it was a UN or something. I think it was WTO. Uh, effort by the f first world to regulate third world sweatshops and, and everybody objected. I mean, it was it was great. I mean, it was de definitely like, um, you, you know, the, the workers and peasants rising up against the elites. Yeah, these countries understand that this is what their current competitive advantage is and if you legislate it away, they're just going to lose business. Um, and, you know, it's interesting too, a lot of these countries do have laws against lots of things, but they simply go unenforced. You know, Bangladesh where there's these factory collapses and fires that have happened, there's safety codes on building laws there. It's just they put in laws that uh, mirror richer Western countries, but that can't actually be enforced there because if they were, it would make the economy a disaster. So then they end up not enforcing their own their own laws. And if you look actually, I mean, a lot of people will say, you know, we have these laws of labor standards. Well, shouldn't they too? But we didn't have those laws when we were at their level of development. My uh, home state where I'm standing right now actually is Massachusetts. We passed the first child labor law in the United States, Jeff. It was, uh, I think, 1842. What it said was children under 12 can't work more than 10 hours per day in a factory. I would be in favor of that more or less. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that seems like a reason, more or less a reasonable uh, uh, standard. I mean, I'm not for any laws, but that certain, certain sounds a lot better than our current laws, which are so preposterous. I mean, our child, you know, we consider 15 year old to 15 year olds to be to be to be children, and even yeah. even 17 year olds are not allowed to work more than 20 hours. It was, the whole thing is ridiculous. Yeah, no, and we look at the other countries. Britain was the same way. They had the first labor, uh, child labor law, and it was like children under nine can't work in the factories. <laughs> these just were these were restrictions that were non-binding for the most part. And right. when we see actually what we see around the world, like child labor, if you get a per capita income of about ten, eleven thousand dollars, it's non-existent. Child labor completely disappears. So when did the United States put in its first child labor law? 1938. What was our income? About ten thousand five hundred dollars in today's terms. Child labor had disappeared. They put in a law after the fact, and that's what we see in the history of a lot of these labor laws. So, uh, so I had been under the impression that that our child labor laws in, the, in this country were imposed as a way of kind of uh, reducing the unemployment rate. Is that is that not the case? Um, so there were vested interest groups, namely unions of adult men workers, who wanted to limit the ability of women and children to compete with them. And this is one way that you'd do it. Now, what happened, of course, during the 19th century, state by state, they passed some different laws on this, but they couldn't get it through at the national level. The business interest lobbied against it. Well, once the process of competition had already eliminated child labor and improved conditions, yeah. businesses no longer had to lobby against it because they had to do this to get workers anyway. So the legislation went through after the fact. Uh, the economists who have studied this around the, the progressive era, uh, both school attendance and child labor, what they find is the laws did very little. It was almost all economic growth that changed yeah. how many children went to school. Except that, except that now the laws are actually positively wicked. I mean, they, they actually prevent, you know, a twelve-year-old, you know, computer geeks or whatever from getting a, a decent job over at, over at Best Buy, uh, where they where they want the jobs. They could be super useful. I mean, I know lots of young teens who would just love to be working. Uh, nights and nights and weekends, but are just forbidden from doing yeah. so. And I, I agree with you here, but it's even more important in the third world where they work not because they want to and build some skills, but out of economic necessity. Uh, mm -hmm. Congressman Tom Harkin proposed to build a ban imports from Bangladesh because they were using child labor. Oxfam found that many of the children were fired, or the children were fired, and then they found that many of them became prostitutes or starved. Mm -hmm. 
clearly worse alternatives than working in the factory. So for them, it's not just about building some skills. It's literally a life or death issue in these poorer countries. And what we find too, by the way, is that children, they work in agriculture in these countries. For the most part, it's agriculture or domestic services where children work. Only a small minority of them work in manufacturing. But it's manufacturing where the pay is higher, where they build more skills that leads to a better standard of living. So when we stop purchasing products made with child labor, we just shift where the children work. We don't get rid of child labor. Yeah, right. Uh, so I do, here's something I don't entirely understand, and since you study it so completely, you might have a better sense of it. It seems to me once you think about the point that uh, sweatshops are the least bad option, and that if they go away, that that people are going to be made worse off. You know, they're going to choose something that's worse. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in the sweatshop in the first place. That's a fairly obvious point once you think about it. Why is it so difficult to explain this to people? I mean, why why is this understanding not you know? Uh, Pervasive. And why are there so many activists who don't seem to be considering this point? Yeah, because they don't understand, uh, and this isn't complicated economics here, this is basic price theory. Uh, if you understand basic price theory, you understand that you can't just legislate these things away. And it's people will recognize, and I'll hear a sweatshop activist say to me, well, I don't advocate closing their factory. I just want them to have better standards, higher pay, all these other things. And it's as if they don't understand that demand curves slope down, and if you raise the cost of doing these things, you're going to destroy some of these jobs. Basically, economics puts limits on our utopias, and these people don't study economics to understand the limitations of what we can accomplish. Yeah, I've noticed this too with uh, many of the movements to buy fair trade coffee. You know, it's a very interesting, I don't know if you followed this whole movement, it's still still sort of going on today. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea is that you shouldn't buy coffee from, uh, from, 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 from coffee plantations where they don't pay their workers enough, uh, where there's not enough, you know, benefits and time off and luxuries and, you know, I don't know what. Uh, but it, it, it seems pretty obvious to me that if you, if you think about this, this is a policy that really discriminates in favor of sort of the heavily capitalized, even possibly state-connected, uh, large-scale coffee manufacturers and discriminates against, you know, sort of fam family-owned, smaller, young upstarts that are trying to trying to get by. And that's sort of the opposite of what you want to happen. Yeah, so I haven't studied fair trade coffee the way I have sweatshops, although I, I hear there's lots of problems where, you know, it's fair trade because they grow it in a co-op, but it's such an inefficient mode of production that you find that they actually earn less than the people working on a plantation. <laughs> But within sweatshops, I can tell you for certain, there's like this group, it's called Shop with a Conscience Consumer Guide. And they guarantee that all of their products are made sweat free. So workers there have good working conditions, they're free to unionize, um, and they're paid a living wage. And I'm trying to find it for you here in the books. I want to show you this map, Let's see if we can do it. Here's a map of where their factories are located. Does that come through? No, it doesn't. Tell me what it says. Uh, it's, a map, it's a map basically of North and South America, and what you find is the vast majority of places that qualify as sweat-free are already located in the United States and Canada. Okay. So people go to this thinking, oh, I'm helping these third world workers because it's you know made sweat-free. No, you get in your factory certified. It's basically a fraud of a buy made in the USA campaign uh, because, of course, you already have these good conditions if you're in the United States. You get certified, but what we're doing is taking away work from the third world and moving it to the first world. So it's just a fraud. That is totally amazing. Because uh, I'm sure that I could go to anywhere in town right now and find exactly products that are listed as sweat free now that you mentioned. I think I, I bumped into this. And it, it basically it's a buy American, buy from the rich campaign. Right. Yeah. <laughs> They're just not saying that. So actually, if we want to help third world workers, now here's a, here's a, you're a marketing guy, Jeff. See if you can figure out how to market this one. What we need is a, a buy made in the third world campaign if we want to help these workers. I, I, I don't see that catching on in America. <laughs> Yeah, I'm headed off uh, in a couple of days off to the Acton University. I, I don't know if you've ever been there, but this is the Acton Institute, and they have about 1,250 people coming this year. And these these are huge issues, especially for people. And these are mostly people who are drawn to issues of economics through religion, which is mm -hmm. more or less a, a kind of a concern for the less well off, you know, sort of uh, uh, orientation. And I guarantee this topic is going to come up. And this kind of analysis will be, for most people, completely shocking and completely uh, new. Yeah, you know, I've actually I've debated some religious studies professors on this issue before. And actually, I wrote a, a column attacking the Pope at one point, too. Uh, religion might direct you towards ends that you care about, you know, the poverty in the third world. Okay, but religion doesn't have a comparative, it actually just isn't capable of giving you your means-ends analysis of how to do something about it. 
That's what we need economics for. So I can embrace the goals of the people coming with religious beliefs about this issue, but they have to take seriously thinking about the means to achieve their goals. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize that the Pope had actually, did he specifically target sweatshops as being bad? No, it wasn't special. It was globalization and uh, uh, international trade more generally. I think yeah. if you Google my column, I think it was called uh, Pope Francis's Erroneous Economic Pontifications or something like that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, pointing to the capitalism that was going on in, in China and India, and just the mass poverty reduction that we've got there through the system. It's just so interesting the number of people who persist in believing that you can just generate wealth all over the world through a, through a protest campaign and and well wishes and and good intentions and just spreading of universal love or whatever. Yeah. Not, you know, not not capital, not not investment, not work, not trade. And you know, and of course, activists could be free to spread that love if they want to start a charity that employs workers in factories in the third world at very high wages and never makes money and they can donate their money to it, that's fine. It's an act of charity. But what they need to do is appreciate that the modern businesses don't feel that way. So if you're going to harness them for the good, you have to not disturb their incentives so that they actually go and do this. Right. Have you, since your book came out, have you gotten a, a lot of uh, attention for with interviews and, and, and things like that? Oh yeah, we've done some TV interviews. I was just over in England on part of a book tour. I was giving three talks over there and I I debated a woman on BBC, so that was fun. Uh, BBC World Ride Radio. Uh, I've done a bunch of these things over the years, but yeah, we're getting pretty good attention for it, and uh, hopefully, we'll get some more. Do you do you usually always win these debates? I mean, what happens? Uh, well, I usually think I do, uh, but that's up for the crowd to decide. It's the interesting thing about debates, right? Is you can believe that you're 100 percent right in your arguments, but it doesn't matter if it doesn't resonate with the people that are hearing you. Um, so I, I love these. Um, I, I think I do pretty good in them. Do you I mean, ever hear any any new arguments you hadn't anticipated, or is it just like routine for you at this point? Every once in a while, you get some new ones. When I was just over London, when I was at King's College London, they came up with some creative points uh, that I hadn't heard before. But that was more of an academic seminar. Most of the pop debate ones, it's it's pretty similar. Every now and then, you get something really crazy uh, that's interesting to debate. I had one a philosophy professor one time, and I was beating him up on on the basic economics of this and. What he resorted to is like, yes, but it'll increase world production, and we're going to strip the planet of all of its resources, and we're going to all be in poverty then. And started See? talking about global warming and stuff, and you know, yeah. that made for a more interesting debate because we got yeah. away from the sweatshops. But it was fun. Well, you dig deep enough among a certain sector of the left, you'll find people that actually don't want wealth. They don't want uh, people to be rich. They don't want economic development. That that's when it gets really perverse. Yeah, in fact, I've encountered that when I've given lectures some places. There's a woman who was questioning me back and forth at one point, and finally what I dragged out of her was she thought economic development was just white and that we were imposing this on the other parts of the world who, I guess, had idyllic lives before capitalism came there and gave them poverty. Uh, yeah, this is, this is the, what Mises calls the chiliastic mindset. He discusses it in socialism. So. Anyway, Ben, thanks so much for joining me. It's really good to see you again and good to connect with you, and I'm glad you had a chance to share all these ideas uh, here with me at this Hangout today. All right. Well, thanks for having me, Jeff. Okay. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Ben Quayle, years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> people are making fun of I can see myself doing that easily. <laughs> So yeah, no, we're we're live. Um, so the, Ben Pal, you're the author of Out of Poverty, and it's and the subtitle is something like yeah, make it easy for you. you can read right off there, Jeff. Okay. Uh, yeah, Out uh, of Poverty: Sweatshops in the Global Economy. Cool. Now this, as so far as you know, is the first kind of systematic examination and more or less defense of sweatshops as an economic institution, right? Yeah, so it's a defense of sweatshops, but of a particular variety. So this isn't a defensive sweatshops that says, you know, there was a threat of violence of making the workers come to work there. Those aren't part of what my study is. Those are slave labor. I think whether you're a libertarian or any other feasible moral view, you should be opposed to slave labor and want to dry up the demand for its product. But I tell you, I could count on, on one hand the number of instances of those I found in the press compared to tons of the other sort. And even those, that one hand is kind of ambiguous where it's not clear what, it's often cases of, workers moving from one country to another where their passports are being held against their will possibly afterwards and it's not clear what the explicit contract was going into that if, if it was an indentured servitude or what have you. 
But but but, but most mostly you find uh, people you know, heaping the to work, admittedly from a bad set of other alternatives. But that choice demonstrates that they believe it's their least bad option. Uh, there are, and I've scanned, so what we did on this, how we define a sweatshop or how I define one is, whatever critics say, that's a sweatshop in a pejorative sense, okay, that's a sweatshop that I'm going to study. So basically from 1995 through 2010, scan all the instances of popular news sources reporting sweatshops uh, in this negative light, and that's what I include in here. There were a few, Jeff, rare instances where there was a case where it could be coercion that's making, and I don't mean the coercion of economic necessity or some garbage like that. I mean where economic efficiency is important, so we need to sacrifice workers for that or put profits over people or any of that type of stuff. What it is, it's a means-ends analysis, very Austrian means-ends analysis, where the ends are the welfare of third world workers or potential workers, and uh, the question is what means are going to help make their lives better. Yeah, and and you do a lot of case studies um, in various places. Are there are there cases of sweatshops that you find okay are inconsistent with economic growth that are violating human rights that sort of thing, uh, and and some that are or do distinguish? It yeah, a lot? so I think it's, it's important that what I'm talking about in this book is sweatshops where workers choose tons of condemnation on these institutions. You look at them and you find out that people are being made better off and being given better options, and that we're at a certain stage of economic growth uh, yeah. where the that's really needed, right? Yeah, I mean, so this is the, the main thing that we that I did in this book is it's the first systematic evidence of how sweatshops compare to the alternative employment in, in these other countries. And what we find is that there's just widespread massive poverty in these countries, people living under two dollars, a dollar twenty-five a day. In these sweatshop cases, every country that we found the sweatshops in, the average protested sweatshop got their workers above that two dollar a day threshold. And I think in fact out of the entire fifteen year time period there were